Uh, next, I have the honour in welcoming from all the way from Goa, the Lower Lakes in South Australia, retired, retired investigative, investigative journalist, uh, marine and aquatic ecology, and producer of the documentary Muddied Waters, and all around good bloke, Ken Jury. Thank you, Paul. Well, greetings from Goa, folks. This is uh, something new for me. I've only been to your wonderful <coughs> town once before, but my gosh, how it's grown. But uh, yes, everyone in Goa that uh, knew that I was heading up this way extends their best. And uh, we want you to know that uh, people down that end of the system are actually thinking about you guys up here. It's not what you may have read in an Adelaide newspaper or what you heard on the radio from perhaps a government representative in South Australia. It's not like that at all. But uh, before I get into this too deeply, I want to uh, also pay tribute to Senator John Manigan and his chief advisor, in uh, Brendan Gulliver, both of whom I've known now for around about two and a half years. Uh, and uh, that uh, first occurrence was because I was in a quest to find a politician that was willing enough to take on the multiple concerns fronting the Murray-Darling Basin. Now the plan was supposed to have been a document of consensus, perhaps with something gained from our own three submission runs. I think most of us would remember those submission runs. Three times we did it. For what? For what? We dared to think on the positive side, whereas we were dished up with a plan of mismanagement from a team that consistently failed in its abilities to understand the basin and the processes necessary when consulting. Your neighbours across the lower lakes generally agree. The authority must now suffer the rigours of a thorough investigation. There's no doubt in our minds as well, down that end. Now thankfully in all of this, I found a politician who cares about people, which is rare in today's politics. For me personally, it's those regular weekly evening calls and short chats I have with Senator John Madigan that convince me this man has compassion when it comes to hurt, resignating from decent, hard-working people throughout the basin. Thank you, John. And uh, I want uh, you to know that uh, we're also sharing your concerns at this end, down at our end, about our food security. Now, my scientist colleague, yes, I work with a scientist. I have the pleasure of doing that. He's a retiree too. We're both uh, in our mid-70s, but we work eight days a week on the Murray-Darling Basin and have been doing so for 11 years. And um, we've investigated it pretty thoroughly. In fact, we could just about say that our, our files would be some of the best you'll find in this country. In a quick CV, I practised as an investigative journalist in marine and aquatic ecology for 48 years. I've worked with all media and on invitation with the South Australian State Government Fisheries Agency for 12 years. But then let's get down to the real business of the MDB and its future. My scientist colleague and I only deal in facts. As a consequence, and I think you'll be pleased about this, we don't use adaptive management or modelling as tools of any of our work. Thank you. <laughs> However, we agree to uh, factor in the overwhelming evidence of climate change. Our study area not only surrounds the 840 square kilometre lower lakes in Goolwa, and I might, I'll just chip in there for a moment. Thank you for putting the pictures on. Just to explain to you before I go any further here, what you're looking at is some of the, the, the destruction that occurred around the lower lakes and Gore and some of those other towns during the Millennium Drought, when things really got bad. Uh, that shot there is actually one of the Tuichiri Barrage, and anyone that says that the ocean doesn't come in, it's actually blowing over that barrage in that shot. A bit later on, I'll explain some of the pictures that you're seeing there, but uh, perhaps this one. Uh, that's actually lime being dropped on acid that had mobilised in Currency Creek, which is attached, of course, to the Goolwood Channel. Now, we, uh, 
We agreed uh, in, in the factor of overwhelming evidence of climate change and our study area not only surrounds the lakes, the 840 square kilometre lakes, the Goolwa Channel and the Icon Coorong, it also extends throughout the basin because in our view what happens upstream also affects the downstream estuarine end of the system and vice versa. And it's with no comfort for many and certainly to us that the authority is on a collision course with its current draconian water issues and its proposed constraints measures. The greatest concerns in our lakes region include the threat of acid mobilisation, the uh, ongoing waste of fresh, fresh, precious fresh water in the lakes, uh, keeping the river mouth clear and the Coorong healthy, and no less today. We share your concerns about the threat of upstream constraints issues and a serious lack of planning and security with regard to future droughts. The Blason, Basin Plan has not delivered security to the lower lakes. If we go into a drought again, there is absolutely nothing to stop the acid mobilising again all the way around us. Now it's agreed there is a need to keep the river mouth open to service the Icon Coorong. But there's nothing substantial in the plan to deal with the community security during low or even no flows through the bottom end, with particular emphasis in halting future mobilisation of sulphuric acid across the, across the region. During the millennium drought, the Lower Lakes area was brought to its knees through a lack of water. When exposed sulphitic soils dried and cracked, when the oxygen reached into the acid-bearing soils to a point where pure sulphuric acid began to mobilise across the region. At all times, the authorities were never keen to seriously communicate and thoroughly debate the introduction of the Southern Ocean as an accepted and proven method to cover the acid-bearing soils. At that stage, we witnessed a system failing us with lake levels receding to one and a half metres below sea level. The state authorities made some feeble attempts with studying ocean water in two small tanks in the systems, in the lakes. But in fact, it, it, it was a dud, complete dud, and they, they didn't want to admit it, but it failed. Now, I spoke to a South, South Australian government scientist about their work with acid, and he replied by saying, we just have to be seen to be doing something. Not a very good answer, is it? At a painful pace, with wind-driven acid bearing dust descending upon near, nearby communities, causing increased health issues, the authorities eventually provided several half-hearted but expensive attempts to contain the acid by various means, including the installation of two earthen regulators, otherwise known as earthen weirs or embankments. The much larger Clayton regulator, and you will see a shot on that sometime tonight, um, was actually constructed from High Marsh Island across to Clayton, which is just a, a few kilometres above uh, Goolwa on the channel. And they were doing that in an attempt to uh, cover and check the mobilising acid downstream. It, 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 you may think perhaps this acid is not so bad, but I can't highlight it enough. Until you've actually seen it mobilised, you just cannot believe it. And by now, in many areas, the acid had reached a highly dangerous pH 1.5, which is about the same level of potency as the acid in your car battery. Now the state authorities used a crop duster aircraft to aerial coat many of the large hot spots across the expansive lakes with crushed limestone. It was actually hauled in at great expense from Robe in the southeast. And of course Robe is known as the, the crayfish capital. It's in the southeast of the state. It was a fruitless exercise. The best advice anywhere with this type of treatment was actually found in South Australia and according to the source, it takes 20 kilos of crushed lime to treat a cubic metre of acid soils at a high pH level, the height we were dealing with. Now, lime treatment from aircraft only dealt with one centimetre deep. Yes, a bit of a joke, isn't it? We were by now up against a potential crisis uh, and uh, the drought continued while water levels receded throughout. In the larger Lake Alexandrina, shrinking water levels exposed large beds of acid-bearing soils. This giant lake 
so large in some areas that you cannot see the other side, contains a minimum of 500 million tonnes of acidic soils in its substrate. Now the smaller Lake Albert's acid soils were tested to a depth of 40 metres and possibly more because they actually ran out of testing rods on the particular day and the acid was still going down further. Now since the end of last year, we are again witnessing the dredging at the Murray Mouth and we've spent 40 million uh, during the millennium drought uh, trying to clear the mouth. And today, of course, as John's already mentioned, we have two dredges there and another four million. And I have no doubt whatsoever in the next month or two they'll be holding out their hands again. Now the Murray River mouth relies on outgoing flows from the lakes with inward and outgoing tidal flows from the Coorong and the channels in order to preserve much of the icon Coorong but not so much the lower lakes and I'll explain why shortly. Now according to the uh, MDBA's educational unit they put out a paper for students where it says a meagre 4% of the rainfall from across the Murray-Darling Basin actually arrives at the Murray Mouth where it flows into the sea. That's what the MDBA says. Now I'll carry on in quotes. Because the journey to the sea from the headwaters is so long, hot, flat and windy, only 4% of the rainfall in the basin will ever find its way to the sea. The rest is diverted en route for irrigation and agriculture or through evaporation, they said. That's the Murray-Darling Basin Authority talking. Now my source for the quote from that was from the MDA's uh, educational arm, which I must admit I've queried on many occasions. Now in recent weeks flows of 9 to 10 gigalitres uh, per day have been crossing the South Australian border for the 350 kilometre flow trip uh, down to the Murray Mouth. It takes a long time to get down that far too. My scientist colleague and I believe that only two gigalitres a day actually get to reach the mouth. The rest of it is either used or evaporates along the way. Now contrary to its educational message, the MDBA in its wisdom created an information sheet in 2012 entitled Murray Flow to the Sea Through Lower Lakes Barrages, where it says, this is a three page document, I know I've got it in my file there, but it's three pages, believe me. The centre page has one sentence. It says, releases through the barrages to sea is difficult to estimate due to tidal effects. The MDVA provides some graphic indication of the, uh, when the gut basin gates are open uh, at the time, but that's all it is. It doesn't show anything on the graph to how much water is physically going through those systems. So if, if you've ever sat there and wondered how much of the water is actually going through the barrages, the simple answer is no one knows. It's abundantly clear none of the state and federal authorities know how much fresh water actually reaches the barrages and how much flows through these structures to the mouth and then of course to the sea. As my scientist colleague Ian Rowan points out, it's been four years since the drought broke and the barrages were reopened, whereby two of those years produced well above average flows with some flooding, part of which we received down our way. But the following two years were well below average, average and we're in those now. About 80% of the 2,750 gigalitres promised for the environment has been recovered so that we should have seen some benefit. Not so. The plan promised increased flows that would keep the Murray Mouth clear for 95% of the time without dredging. Uh, dredging today is expected to last to at least till the end of June this year, which would represent at least 10% of that 95% of time, which means that we're, we're eating into it fairly heavily already with no sound policies or anything to clear the mouth. Now I'm getting to something here soon that we want to change this and turn things around. I am coming to it. Now the plan promised to keep Lake Alexandrina fresh and below 1000 ECU. ECU is electrical conductivity units. That's how they measure uh, salinity. 
uh, and they wanted to keep that below uh, Lake Alexandrina below the 1,000 ECU for 95% of the time. Now, in recent, uh, in a recent South Australian government NRM report, I think most of you up here would know what NRM stands for, National Resources Management. The particular document, I've got a copy of it here, I need to show you, that's the proof. The NRM authors concluded that having regard to future climate change and sea level rise, there is little prospect of keeping the lakes fresh in the longer term and that alternative management plans for the lower lakes should be investigated. The people that put that together had actually hit the knuckle on the head. Ian and I had been working for 11 years and we were so wrapped to find that someone else had verified our work. So much so that we helped them advertise it right across the country. Since then in South Australia, quite amazingly, this government document has been withheld off publication. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? The conclusion is well supported by our observations and hard copy recordings of ocean inflows over the past few years. Um, in the meantime, valuable upstream water is still being taken and used in the lower lakes. What we're witnessing today is a combination of many problems, including an unworkable plan, questionable management, methodology in particular, a changing climate with further drought and greatly reduced runoff into the headwater catchments. And I should add, while we're at that, the latest figures, I don't know if you keep an eye on these things, but the Murray-Darling Basin put out the whole of basin storage figures once a fortnight or thereabouts. The latest readings on the 11th of this month was 9,200 and 9,220, or three, sorry, 9,324 gigalitres, or 42%. That's all we've got left in the storages. That's the whole of storages. Now, I have the figures since 2012. I, I twisted the arm of the authority to give me most of those, but they, they came up, they came good eventually. I've actually balanced those out over the last few months. At the rate we're using water right now, the average for the last few months, if we keep up that average, it tells us that the whole of storage is in the Murray-Darling Basin will be empty. And that could happen by September this year. I hope I'm wrong. What we're witnessing today is a, is a combination of many things and, and so on. So we, we, we recognise, of course, that sustainable diversion limits throughout the basin are extremely necessary in food production. Believe me, we're for food production. We have to eat too. However, we do understand your problems with water supply up here, where it's a case of securing enough water at a reasonable price when competing with other natural and man-made factors, including the massive waste of billions of dollars of worth of our most precious commodity at the lower end of the system. With diminishing flows throughout, it's also becoming the main reason behind the need to dredge the river mouth at great expense over and over again. Quite simply, while all water needs are generally relevant, the fact is we don't have enough fresh water in such a variable system to serve all requirements at the same time, from one end of the system to the other, and always against the odds of further drought and climate change. Now, without stronger flows through the barrages, mouth silting and sanding will continue indefinitely. Now, in recent weeks, we've only had about 10 gigalitres a day. I mentioned that earlier over the border. And as I said before, we only get about two gigs of that arriving down, going down past Goolwa. Now, South Australian Government Department spokesman told the Murray Valley Standard newspaper on January the 30th this year, and I quote, about two gigalitres per week is the minimum needed to keep the mouth open. Quote, unquote. That's equal to about two square kilometres by a metre deep of water. And that's well shy of what really is need, needed to clear the mouth. It's nowhere near it. So here it is again. We have an official statement provided to the media containing contradictions regarding flow rates through the barrages. The MDBA has already said it has no way of measuring outflows through the barrages. And it's obvious that the Estate Authority 
uh, doesn't see fit to communicate with the MDBA all that often. Now during a short period in April to May in, in May in 2011, the remnants of a minor flood estimated to be in the order of 80 gigs a day over the border, flowed over the, over the border and, and at a much reduced rate finished up at our place, 350 k's down. And again, that water made no difference whatsoever to the Murray Mouth. Today we're not only dealing with the contents of a questionable MDB plan, we're also questioning the waste of fresh water in the lower lakes and the MDBA's audacious constraints issues that will affect all Basin States and its people. We regularly ask, is there a solution with the lower lakes? Uh, we, the answer we give is we believe there is. There are those within this audience tonight who have read a copy of the document, A Better Way. Now I have some copies here later, some of you might like to have a copy. Just uh, check with me later. Now, th th A Better Way was for the Murray-Darling Basin and there are hundreds of others across the basin who also have a copy of that document. Even the PM has a copy. Uh, there is a solution. It's been discussed and it cl clearly it's accepted by the readers at least as being a solution. And it, it will also deal in the massive constraints issues at the same time. I think it'll be good news for a lot of people if we can actually pull this off. If adapted, I'll go as far as saying that upriver constraints should no longer be an issue. In a condensed form and in a single terms, we should be mindful how the previous federal government offered well over $10 billion towards repairing the basin, although we're doubtful this level of expenditure will be required for the solutions I'm about to offer. There are several steps. The first step is to build an additional river lock. We'll name it Lock Zero between Wellington and Taylor Bend in South Australia. Some of the locals have already named this as Lock Zero for reasons that the first river lock, of course, Lock One, is found at Blanchetown in South Australia. Now, suitable solid foundations for such a structure are no longer a concern today, given that friction piling has become the norm for major structures across the world, and no less, in fact, with the bridge that uh, spans Goolwa to High Marsh Island. That bridge is also on friction piling. So we can actually put a new lock pretty well anywhere. Step two concerns provisions for improved flows out of the barrages to the mouth, with work to be done to the Goolwa barrage to be actioned during the construction of Lock Zero. In particular, it's, it's recommended that the cumbersome individual Goolwa barrage logs or blocks for any of you who have been down there, you've seen them. They are so cumbersome and, and time consuming. We, we're saying that they should throw the logs away and we'll put something else in. And what we're talking about here is to have all the logs removed and replaced with single, low cost, thick walled poly tanks to be prefabricated to fit the same log slots currently found in each bay. To form at the height, full height dimensions according to the overall height of the current logs, which are all stacked on top of each other, if you can imagine that. Now these tanks would be individually operated by a small pump to each tank, using the water as the hydraulics through a tap at arm configuration for pump raising and pump lowering the tanks quickly in a single motion. Should the lakes return to being estuarine, the speed of which these individual bays can, can be opened and closed will have a bearing on the quality of flows to clear the Murray mouth. In an estuarine scenario, with both Lake Alexandrina and Lake Albert full, by only lowering the levels of the two lakes by one centimetre, would provide 80 gigalitres to clear the mouth. Now we know that's not quite enough. We've already discussed that this evening. So if we lowered the lakes, let's say, to two centimetres, we would have 160 gigalitres to clear the mouth and the channels. Step three, it's recommended that Bird Island, which is located in the estuarine end of the Mundu Channel, almost opposite the Murray Mouth, be partially or totally removed as it restricts flows out of the already shallow Mundu Channel towards the river mouth. Now Bird Island is interesting. Uh, it was a mere sandbar prior to the building of the Mundu Barrage. 
Given that this constraint is removed, be it partially or fully, we'll accept either. Water out of nearby Alexandrina, flowing through the Mundu Barrage and through the Mundu Channel, opening at the eastern end of the Coorong, will provide additional flow benefits to scouring the Murray Mouth, located almost opposite the Coorong. And uh, a lot of people have discussed this, even people in some of the Adelaide universities. Now step four, we're getting near the end. By now we'll manipulate the barrages to allow free, highly oxygenated Southern Ocean water to return into the lower lakes and up to the new Lock Zero, where already we've retained 1,800 gigalitres of fresh water, or 40%, of the 4,500 gigalitres of water, fresh water that we ordinarily use down there. So there's 1,800 instead of 4,500, or 40%. And we use that annually through, uh, to uh, mix with the, the ocean water uh, into uh, an estuarine feature. Now these modifications will provide for a surplus of 2,700 gigalitres plus of fresh water no longer required to be held upstream for growers and for the environment. The plus I mentioned, there is a reason for the plus, over and above the 2,700 gigalitres already saved, is for additional fresh water collected as a result of the several small rivers and streams that flow up from the lofty ranges into Lake Alexandrina. These additional volumes of fresh water into, into the lake will improve uh, and, uh, the uh, give back amount. That's what we're calling it, the give back amount into the food bowl, where we envisage increased returns from our food bowl to the benefit of the nation. And incidentally, to those who query the environmental organisation Ramsar in all of this, of which Australia, of course, is a signatory to the Convention regarding the Lower Lakes and the Coorong, we believe our commitment with Ramsar is likely being misrepresented in this area. Ramsar is not concerned about the type of system so long as that system is a healthy working system, according to Professor Max Finlayson. He was the then Australian Ramsar representative when he was speaking to a PAC meeting in the Goolwood Council Chambers very recently. Of significance, given that the proposal table today is ever adopted, it will no longer be necessary to remove any upstream constraints. The audacity to think that the, the countless floodplain farmers, communities and councils would face ruin, just to keep a river mouth clear in my opinion, is sheer lunacy. While many of you have a copy of uh, 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 the Better Way document, I just say, I repeat again, I do have some spare copies here. This is how we feel down the bottom end. I hope you've gained something from what I've said and uh, we'd like to think that you'd help us fight our battle down there too. We need the politicians. Certainly we've got uh, a wonderful senator with us tonight who's fighting hard for all of this, but we do need your help elsewhere too. We need, to, we need the politicians to understand that we don't have enough water to furnish everything. But if we do it this way, we will have, and we can return some for you guys where it counts. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ken, and I'm sure everyone <laughs> in the basin will appreciate the 2,700 gigs back. Uh, well done.